Welcome to Pushing the Limits. Well, hi everyone. I am super, super excited today. I can't tell you how long I've been studying for this and preparing for this and just super excited to meet this wonderful woman that I'm going to introduce you to, Liz Parrish. Welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you for having me. And the more I learn about you, I mean, I, I think that if you're that excited, um, I'm twice as excited. I was so fascinated by your story. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You're the one of the most amazing women on the planet. You have some of the biggest dreams I've ever seen and you're just going for it and you don't, you, you just single-mindedly going for it no matter what anybody does or says or or, or any any obstacles that come in, you, in your path and for me that was just am amazing to to see what you've done and of course so for those listening um Liz is the uh, CEO of BioViva and she is uh someone who's really bringing forward longevity medicine genetic uh therapies into the world and trying to get this available for all of us to target aging. So buckle up for a bit of a ride. Liz, can you give us a bit of a background? Why did you end up where you are now? Well, uh, years ago, I was taking bi biology in college, and, and I dropped out because I got pregnant with my second child. And my first child was a bit low birth weight, and I didn't want to have the same complications. I intended to go back, but life got complicated, and some... Many years later, uh, that second child was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, because I had loved biology, I had always stayed close to it, and I worked on many projects. And the project that I was working on when he was diagnosed was a stem cell project. It was about patient advocacy and education of the general public of what stem cells were and what they were not and why they needed to get funding. And I had kind of fallen in love with genetics during that time, but my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And while in children's hospital, I um, was searching for answers in the regenerative medicine space of how they could help him. And uh, I was shocked to find out that all of this great technology uh, that I had read about that had been around for over a decade uh, didn't translate to patients who needed it. And this was a big turning point in my life. So I went looking for cures for kids. I got on airplanes. I, you know, drove us long distances. I went to conferences and I ended up at a conference uh, that was about biological aging. And uh, biological aging, like type 1 diabetes, is a complex disorder. And in order to treat complex disorders with genetics, um, it was, it looked like it was actually a very viable project. We needed to find a combination of genes that would do such thing. And by doing that, uh, we could not only have curative medicine for children, but help an aging population live longer. Wow. And since working in therapeutics and children is so constrained, it's very difficult to get access to young people who need medicine. I figured an aging population was the fastest place to start and help everyone. <laughs> and your end goal, though, is not only to stop aging, <laughs> it's a big dream, <laughs> but also to help children with these sort of complex disorders. And you believe gene therapy is the answer to this. Can you, you know, you, you've started a company, Bioviva. You've got some incredible uh, scientific advisors. You actually Why went actually and had gene therapies way back in, I think it was 2015, where you had the first ones. Um, and there are specific genes that we can already go after with these gene therapies. Can we go back and just explain what is a gene therapy? How do we deliver it into the body? And what are the, um, what are the risks involved and what are the advantages that it, that it has? Yeah, let's do a little bit of history. You know, it, it was finally recognized in the 1970s that by modifying the genes uh, in an organism that we could probably drastically change disease outcome. And why we know uh, that gene therapy will work and, and how we know that eventually we will find a cure for aging through gene therapy is that it's working today. So in the United States, there are 11 uh, gene therapies that are mm. approved. Uh, for uh, what's considered monogenic disease. So people who are born with a single gene mutation 
uh, things like diseases like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, uh, hemophilia A and B, lipoprotein lipase deficiency. These are really big names, adrenaleukodystrophy. These are big names uh, given to diseases that were caused by a single gene. And these 11 approved gene therapies are curative medicine for these individuals. And now with these approved therapies and the proof of concept behind us, we know we can take on complex disorders. So when we started to look at genes that would affect childhood diseases that are more complex than a single gene mutation and things like biological aging, which we also know are complex, meaning they are not caused by a single gene, uh, we started to look at the big powerhouse players, and those are the ones that you're alluding to. So uh, Bill Andrews, uh, who you spoke about, is our advisor on telomerase reverse transcriptase. Again, it's a big name, but it is, uh, it's a little gene that transcribes something called telomerase that yep. lengthens caps at the ends of your chromosomes. And this shortening of these caps limit your lifespan. And today we know that 24 organisms uh, lifespans are limited by telomeres and the other thousands of species just haven't been, uh, there hasn't been enough research to define it and say that actually it's causal to their lifespan. So in 24 species, enough re research has been done to know that our lifespan is limited by our cellular division and cellular division is limited by the caps at the ends of our chromosomes. Uh, we also, so that gene therapy um, can extend lifespan in model organisms by about 40%. And so for you and I, if we were gonna live to 80, that could bring us over the 110 mark, giving us more time to live long enough uh, to benefit from the new therapies that are emerging in mm -hmm. the combination space. So there's also genes like alpha clotho that's associated as a geroprotector, protects your kidneys, your cardiovascular, improves your cognition. Mm -hmm. um, that's been proven all the way through non-human primates. And we showed a study uh, in humans, uh, five subjects that it increased their cognitive scores as well. Um, there's that the dementia study that you, you did recently or that was yeah, done was, recently? It was about two years ago that we released that, and it was with patients with dementia, five patients with dementia. Um, there's folistatin that increases your muscle mass, and that's good for metabolic health. That's where your, you know, some of your metabolism lies is in how much muscle you have, which is important Huge. about these new drugs that are coming out that make you lack um, a, a response to hunger. Um, you end up losing a lot of muscle mass. So that can be counterintuitive, but still good to do if you're grossly obese. Mm -hmm. And then PGC1 alpha and other genes. And, and actually those four genes I have taken myself. Wow. And and you like, you don't mind me saying how old you are. You're 52, I believe. Is that right? I'm, I'll be 53 this month. Yeah. And look at you. I mean, for crying <laughs> out loud. Who doesn't want to look like her? <laughs> hey, hey, I, I, I wish I looked better. Um, you know, but when, when I did amazing. the therapies, therapies do go after aging. Um, you know, we want, I want to try higher doses of the therapies mm -hmm. and more, more therapies because we know it's going to be a combination that will cure aging. But thank you. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean, you look I'll gorgeous, absolutely stunning. <laughs> but you, you, yeah. But this is, but it's not about just the aesthetics here. We, we're really talking yeah. about on a cellular level, and I really want to differentiate that because people right. still think of anti aging as the skin creams and the, you know, not the ones who listen to my show. But generally, people when you talk about anti aging, that's the first thing they come as wrinkles and um, skin aging. It's so much more as what's on the inside and these four that you've just mentioned the folistatin the clotho the pgc1 alpha uh what was the other one the telomerase. Uh, yeah telomerase obviously yeah bill stuff these are really key factors for function you know so as well as how you're going to live your life i mean folistatin I mean, we can take things like EGCG, which will have a small, tiny effect on the folistatin, but nowhere near as what the gene therapies are. So we already know some of the, the mechanisms by, by which these things work. But really, when you add them all up, these are going to really be able to reverse aging. I mean, with you, when you had the therapies, you were patient number one on a number of these, I believe. Um and were you scared to take them? Were you, or were you just excited to get this? And how did you, 
actually experience that and, and how did it affect you afterwards in as far as changes and so so on so I think that you know when I look back at the writing uh, that I did around that time which I'm not a prolific writer at all but I decided to write some of my thoughts down during that time I mean it was um it was it was yeah it, it was scary but I mean my son has a chronic dis condition that is an hour by hour. It's not even a day by day. Wow. And there was so much evidence that, that there was a blocking of good medicine to humans that okay. good medicine isn't making it into clinical trials. And knowing what we knew, somebody had to do it. And it, it just made sense that I do it because I was the CEO of the company and why shouldn't I take the risk? So if there's a bad outcome, it happens to me instead of someone else. Wonderful. And um, I, I just, you know, I mean, we, we really did sit on a razor of, we don't have to do this, but if we don't do it, then, you know, at that point, I think it was 8 billion people might not see a cure for, for the biggest killer on the planet. So we decided to go forward. And wow. I, I don't think I could have lived with myself. Obviously, I couldn't have lived with myself if I didn't do it because I did it. And um, and then we waited. To and see then you waited would. to see what would happen. And <laughs> uh, there's such courage because it's pi oh. it's the pioneers and the same in the ultra marathon and the adventure, adventure space. It's the person who climbed Mount Everest first, you know, <laughs> um, which happens to be a Kiwi and a Nepalese. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they are the ones that we stand on their shoulders when we come after them. And it takes brave people to take these brave steps and find ways around the obstacles in the, in the regulatory space there are, we'll get to that a little bit later um there are a lot of obstacles and as you said and I've experienced this in my life um after I lost my dad three years ago and I was not able to get him the things that I knew would give him a chance at survival wouldn't guarantee his survival but give him a chance at survival he had a, a aortic aneurysm and he uh, survived the operation but developed sepsis. And I was aware of all of the research around intravenous vitamin C and sepsis. And um, I came with the, 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 the clinical research. I presented it. I said, I want intravenous vitamin C. And I just came up against a brick wall. And I, I, um, I feel you 100%. I have a, a similar story. I mean, like I said, we just didn't meet each other. I, we're sisters. Otherwise... My, my father uh, came to me several years ago um, asking if we had something that uh, he could use because he had Parkinson's disease. Wow. And by the time he decided uh, to try gene therapy, uh, he was stone face and uh, basically shuffling his feet. They, they really can't pick their feet up well anymore at all. And uh, we did gene therapy uh, in combination wow. with stem cells, and we got two more years. Wow. And and even uh, when my dad died, he could still smile. And uh, I mean, it was no consolation because he died. And that's why I rarely talk about it. Mm. But the thing is, there were clinical trials going on. But because he was over 80, he didn't qualify. And, and this gets into regulation, why we need new regulations. People should not be turned away for being 80, especially when we know that a multitude, four times more people will live to be over 100 in the next couple decades. That means you still have a lot of viable life left. And my dad was a marathon runner. Wow. He walked miles. Um, he was an active person. And, you know, what happens is the, the uh, basic care uh, that they do for Parkinson's uh, is up the dosage of dopamine and eventually he got congestive heart failure. Mm. And so, um, and then, you know, that's legal to give. Uh, so the healthcare providers provide it, uh, but they don't provide alternatives and these people need alternatives. So we did get two years of going on vacation uh, with my father. We got to celebrate his birthday in Lake Tahoe. He walked on his own, Wonderful. Uh, took us all to dinner. Uh, but he died. And yeah. it's because, you know, families can't afford to keep doing expensive gene therapies. We need a route in which people can get access. I mean, I mean, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. And um, 
you know, as someone else, I've been fighting with, you know, for my mum for the last eight years, rehabilitating her, and I'm, I constantly come up against brick walls. You know, when we first had the aneurysm and the stroke, and she was like a baby in a in a woman's body, unable to do anything. And I was told, you know, she would never ever do anything again. Well, they were wrong. <laughs> they were damn wrong. And it wasn't even, you know, like I went and did things that were um, as, as, as advanced as I could access at the time, you know, like gene therapies and things that we, we didn't have access to, but hyperbaric oxygen therapy we could do. And I could train her hours and hours every day and, you know, re rehabilitate her brain and vestibular system and teach her to everything. Um, so it took thousands of hours and we got her back to full, full health again, full driver's license, full power of attorney back. And then we were hit with a uh, CNS lymphoma and my listeners know that story. And, um, and so then I went into the metabolic approach to cancer because nothing was offered. She was over 80 and there was nothing that they could do apparently. And I went after uh, advanced genetic testing found out her susceptibilities for her particular cancer, chased around the country to get those specific ones, went and got peptides, which you believe me, getting those into New Zealand isn't easy, did all sorts of things that, you know, I had to do to save her life. And it took us 12 weeks to get rid of the tumours that were visible on the MRI. And we've been free of those ever since. And you're, we have other... You are relentless. I mean, that, <laughs> that, and that's what you have to be. You have to say, you know, you have to look at the standard of care yeah, and you have to admit the emperor has no clothes. Yes, it look has. at research. We are well, well beyond this. Like you know, people freaked out this year. You know, AI hit the computer. These chat systems. Medicine is far in advance of software. We are far in advance of that, but none of it has been allowed into clinical trials because the cost to get there and the unpredictive animal models that we have to use. Um, in order to prove that something will work in a human. The best place for new medicine is in a human. We're not in the days of demystifying small molecules anymore. We're using genes that we vastly know how they work. Your cells are the drug factory. The gene goes in and your cells make the protein. And it's just, it's just such different medicine. And even hyperbaric oxygen chambers that you used and, and other things that you were doing, you know, that had well-known uh, effect on mm. uh, healing uh, tissues in the body and things like that for a very long time. And it's just not standard of care because it's no, it's not on the checklist of what doctors uh, can legally do uh, to treat patients. And doctors are set up to write you a prescription and get you the hell out of there. They're not there for, uh, you know, functional uh, medicine mm. uh, that will help you at the core level uh, be better you know yeah, what exactly. are you what are you doing what can we do with your lifestyle and then let's look at your genes yeah absolutely and it's very reactionary and you know that that 20th century model of you know ambulance at the bottom of the cliff reactionary model is really outdated and the, the fact that it's so pharmaceutically you know orientated with therapies like hyperbaric oxygen therapy or other you know many many others um, have super powerful, super proven clinical research even up the wazoo and we still can't get it through and we still can't get it funded and yet we know, you know, and you have cases like like my mum's where, you know, not a single medical practitioner has ever asked me, well, how did you do it and why is she not dead? You know, yeah. nobody's interested. No, there, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's not uh, money in that because their system isn't set up for that. So, yep. you know, they need a, they need a, a, a checks and balances of what they can legally do. What's the expectation? What are the symptoms? And here are these, these pills that we can legally give you to treat the symptoms. Yep. And that's uh, about it. I've spoken to a couple of graduating classes um, in medicine. And when I tell them uh, what we do and how we, expect the future to change how we expect these gene therapies that i talked about that sound like whoa that's new medicine how we expect those to be used in young people long before you uh, get sick with biological aging symptoms they're just literally blown away and they're i had someone raise their hand to i thought they were asking a question they just said i just want to tell you that you've basically told me everything they didn't tell me in mm -hmm. in medical school and i'm completely confused now you know, we learned how to prescribe for symptoms and you're saying that we could probably treat the root cause of what's causing all of these symptoms. 
And it is such a paradigm shift for those who have been through one system of learning and are very over-regulated to the point of, you know, they cannot without jeopardizing their entire careers. And I get that. Um, Step outside the box or they will have their head cut off. And this is stifling the introduction of new things. And we're like 30 years behind. And when you live in New Zealand, probably a little bit more. Um, really, really behind the times and what is actually available. And if you, you might think, well, we've got to be super careful, but there are millions and millions of people dying every year that don't need to die. And yeah, we could be giving them million. extra. Yeah, 41, 41 million. Mi- 41 million people not given the dignity uh, to try new medicine, not their doctors, not given the ability to prescribe new treatments and have medicine be between them and a patient, literally 41 million people. And uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly tragic. Each one of those is a book burning that you'll never get back. Exactly. And each one, one of these of is a is person, someone's loved is someone's loved one. And this is, the, this is the point. These are not statistics. These are people with stories and they could be helped now. And if you are in a situation like I was with my dad or your dad, and there are no other options, why are we not allowed the right to try? You know, why can we not? And I was not asking for the world. We're talking intravenous vitamin C here, basic, 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 basic. I I wasn't even asking for a gene therapy and I still couldn't get it. You know, I, I even had a dog who was dying of wobblers. Let's, let's take this to pets. Um, and this is when their spine closes and they can no longer walk. And I work with a vet in Mexico. He treats all the the zoos animals and and he gets dogs walking again, who've been hit by cars, not guaranteed, but in many cases he can help with spinal injuries. He, uh, basically did his research under a woman who did stem cells in humans. And so he worked with her to understand how to bring that to pets and he had a simple treatment that might or might not work. Um, it was all of the products were legal products. It's the dog's own PRP, platelet-rich plasma. He had a protocol. He was offering it for free to any vet who would help us so that we wouldn't have to ship our dog away in the, the last months of his life. And we couldn't even find a vet that would do a legal treatment with legal uh, blood products in my dog. I contacted veterinary hospitals. I contacted veterinaries in my area and they wouldn't even touch it. And one even wrote back to me saying that this guy was clearly trying to take me for my money and take advantage of me because it must just be their, their response. It was free. It was obviously didn't know you. (laughs) They obviously didn't even read the email. No, they didn't know they underestimated who you were as well. (laughs) And so that's how behind everything is. Yeah. Injecting some platelet rich plasma, you know, it's just basic. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. So we have a a bunch of people who have been trained uh, incorrectly uh, for the future of medicine. And uh, without the approval of the government, they don't want to move forward because their student loans are more than they're making. And, uh, it's it's it, it's a bit of a catastrophe. So we have to switch mindsets. If we want to live and we want to live well, and we want to see a future uh, for humans, uh, we need to switch mindsets. Yeah.